So we had started with algebraic function. We had uh, introduced uh, algebraic sets. Zero sets of polynomials. So subsets of AN. And then we had uh, talked about some simple properties that introduce this a risky topology. on AN or on any algebraic set such that the closed subsets are uh, defined algebraic sets. We've seen that every algebraic set is a zero set of an ideal and we also have find the idea of an affine algebraic set which consists of all functions which vanish on And then uh, we <coughs> had uh, started to talk about the Hilbert Lisa theorem. <coughs> we had said what it means for him to mean unitarian. One is an Italian. If uh, two equivalent properties hold, <coughs> one is Italian. If, uh, if um, we have the ascending chain condition for, ideal, for ideals, chain of ideals, one contained in the other, uh, in, in the many, then they have to become stationary, so up to a certain point all ideals are the same. And uh, the equivalent statement was that every ideal in R is finitely general. So it has been chosen as the ideal generated by finitely many elements. And now we wanted to see uh, the Hilbert basis theorem. So if If R is a Unitarian ring, then it follows the polynomial ring is Unitarian. And we are mostly interested in the case that we have K, so it follows if we have a field K x1 to xn is Unitarian. This is because fields are certainly Unitarian rings. Okay, so now let's start with the proof. So we've actually made the task easier by uh, this generalization of doing it with the general ring instead of with k, because now we can use induction. So it is enough to prove that um, if r is Unitarian, 
and this implies that Rx is integral. No, because we know that Rx1 to Xn, our definition is Rx1 to Xn minus 1 xn, so polynomials in xn whose coefficients are polynomials in x1 to xn minus 1. So therefore we can use induction. If we know r is Newtonian, then rx1 is Newtonian, then rx1 x2 is Newtonian, and so on. So that's the chain called by much. So now we will prove the contraposition. So we assume that Rx is not Newtonian, and we want to show that R is not Newtonian. No, and we have to show that R is not Newtonian. So we have to find a way to come from Rx to R. And we do th this by look looking at the leading coefficient, so the coefficient of highest degree of polynomials in Rx. So, so <coughs> let me do this. Let's see where I am. So, let me see if I want to show R. Ah, it's not comparing. And the idea is to look at the leading coefficients. Basically, instead of an ideal generated by polynomials, we look at the corresponding ideal generated by the leading coefficients, and we will somehow see that if uh, we have this neutrality condition violated for one, we have it violated for the other. And so <coughs> let's see how this goes. So we assumed that our x is not neutrality. So let i in our x be an ideal which is not finite generated. So now we want to, uh, you know, <clears throat> to somehow make out of this a chain of uh, ideals in R, which does not become stationary. So we do we take first um, f1 and i without zero uh, polynomial of minimal degree. Each of them has a degree, the highest power of x, which occurs with non-zero coefficient. And we take, we choose one polynomial here, which has the smallest possible such thing. As these are all positive integers, there will always be a smallest one. So we just take that. And we do this, and we uh, go on inductively. Uh, let, say, Fn, okay, Fn plus 1, we want this, no, we don't, be the polynomial of minimal degree. minimal degree in what in the complement of what we are told before. 
So we keep track of these degrees, so let nk be equal to the degree of fk. So the highest power of x that occurs. Then we let ak be the leading coefficient of fk. So that means the coefficient of x to the nk. By definition, we have n1 is smaller or equal to n2, smaller or equal to n3, and so on. So they, these degrees grow. Because here, the first one, we choose a polynomial of minimal degree out of the whole of i without zero. Next time, we choose you know, this thing in i without f1. So we choose this polynomial of minimal degree in a smaller set. Each time it gets smaller, so these degrees can be grow. And we can also look at the leading at these coefficients. I can look at these ideals. I can look at the ideal generated by A1. The circle is contained in the ideal generated by A1 and A2, and so on. We have an ascending chain of ideas. In R, no, we just take the idea generated by the leading coefficients of these polynomials. So we we'll always get one by one. So we have an ascending chain of ideas, and I claim this chain does not become stationary, thus R is not determined. So, Okay, so we can put this indirectly, so assume it does. So if from some point onwards they are all the same, then it must be must be one point where one such idea is equal to the next one. So then there exists an L such that A1 until AL is equal to A1 until AL and AL plus 1. Okay. And if we want to show that uh, this cannot be, so the, these ideas are this chain in this chain, the exclusion is always straight. And this comes from our choice that we made here that we always choose the polynomial with minimal degree, as we shall see. So assume, we assume it does, uh, and then what? Um, where am I? So, so that means, so, this means that this AL plus 1 is in the idea generated by these. So thus we can write AL plus 1 is equal to sum i equals 1 to L, EI times AI with the EI sum elements in R. That means that uh, this element lies in the idea generated by the AI. So we can write down the following. We write down a new polynomial, which we call G. 
uh, which is fn plus 1, minus the sum i equals 1 to l, ei times x to the n l plus 1 minus ni times fi. OK, so this I claim is a polynomial. So first, let's see, this power is always non-negative. So this makes sense. We don't have some negative power of x here, because we know that the, uh, the, uh, these numbers are growing. And f plus 1 is bigger than all this in i. So this number here is bigger equal to this number. So this is actually this polynomial multiplied by some non-negative power of x. So this makes sense. <coughs> and so first, we know that g uh, is an element in i in, uh, yes, our i minus f1 until ff. So certainly it is an i because it's in the, in the ideal generated by f1 to ff plus 1. And why is it not here? So if not, if it was, Uh, then we would have that we can bring this to the other side. No? We just bring this whole thing to the other side. We would have that fl plus 1, which is equal to g plus the sum i equals 1 to l bi x to the nl plus 1 minus ni times fi, that this would be an element in f1 to fr. Because if g lies here, all of these lie here, so we would stay in this idea. But you know, we have chosen fl plus 1 not to lie. Okay? So this cannot be. On the other hand, now we are interested in the degree of this point. I claim, so what is the degree? So, but, so, any of these summits, so this polynomial has to be n i. I multiply it by this, so this summon <coughs> has degree n i minus n i plus n l plus 1. So each summon has degree n l plus 1. to the nl plus 1, so minus sum i equal 1 to l bi ai, which, uh, you know, is precisely 0, because this is equal to this, so this is 0. And so therefore, you know, so all the summons have this degree, but 
if I sum up, the, but in this degree, we actually get zero. So that means the degree is at most, is actually smaller than an L plus one. So that's the degree of G is smaller than an L plus one. And notice that this is a contradiction to our choice. We certainly were free to choose uh, our L plus 1 to be of minimal degree. And now we have found one thing which has the same properties of smaller degree. This is the contradiction. And so that means it was actually impossible that we could write this. And so it means the, uh, uh, this chain did not become stationary and uh, R was not unitary. Okay, that proved it. Okay, so this was this thing. As I said, this is a, <clears throat> it's a remarkably simple proof for a kind of uh, originally quite difficult theorem. You know, somehow it seems like somehow the optimal way, I mean, you know, to find such a trick. I mean, there you can also, one can maybe have also more direct proofs, more constructive ones, but something as slick uh, is somehow. Uh, you know, there's this, um, you know, it's kind of like it was the, the optimal proof. Um, uh, okay, so now we want to give uh, some more, some geometric applications of this, which are <coughs> actually, it's if or not at all clear why this should be uh, an application, I mean, why it should follow. But there is a geometric application which basically says that every fine algebraic set can be written as a finite union of smaller defined algebraic sets which cannot be further decomposed. So you have some kind of, so um, these are the irreducible components. We'll soon see what the statement is. So you can think, for instance, if you take in R2, in, in, in A2, you can look at zero set of the polynomial x, y in A2. The real picture, so where x and y are the coordinates, the real picture would be something like that. No? If you now, if you were with the real numbers, would be the union of these two coordinate axes. You can somehow see that this has two pieces. No? This is equal to z of x union z of y. Okay? So we can decompose this into these two pieces. Um, and uh, you will, we will call an affine algebraic set irreducible if it cannot be decomposed in such a way. If we cannot decompose it as a union of two closed subsets unless one of them is already equal to it. So you cannot decompose it as a union of two smaller closed subsets. So Irreducibility is a bit like a much, much stronger version of connected. Now, connected means you cannot decompose it as a union of two, uh, of two uh, closed subsets which don't, which, uh, don't intersect. No, you cannot write it as a union of two closed and disjoint subsets. Here we just say you cannot write it as a union of two closed subsets unless one of them is already equal to the whole thing. Obviously, you can always take that. Yeah. And so that's a much stronger statement. <coughs> and it's also a statement which doesn't, it doesn't really make much sense to talk about such things with a normal topology. You know, what would be an irreducible subset of uh, whatever R with the, you know, with the usual topology? I think the only such subsets would be points. No? So it would be nonsensical, but with a risky topology, this becomes an interesting concept. Okay, and so let's see how this works. So, so in, in a fine algebraic like set, is called irreducible. 
if it cannot be written. precise definition data or the formal one. Now we want to show every defined algebraic set is the union of finitely many. Irreducible closed subsets. And if you make the correct definitions, these are unique and will be called the irreducible components. Okay. And now, in some surprising fact, this has actually to do with the fact that kx1 to xn is an Okay, And we um, so one could directly prove it in this form using directly the, the fact that case one to xn is Unitarian, but we will want to use this result later in greater, greater generality, consequences for projective varieties and things like that. <coughs> and so there, therefore, it's uh, better to give a slightly more abstract proof, so which uh, is in the language of topology. So I will talk about Unitarian topological spaces. And uh, the point is then that AN, or affine algebraic sets, are Unitarian. And uh, so let me, and the fact that as a topological space AN is Unitarian is basically a restatement of the fact that KX1 to XN is Unitarian as a thing. OK, so let's. Uh, do this. So definition a topological space X is Unitarian if it satisfies a kind of chain condition very similar that as the one for the ideas we had before. Ah, no, actually, I first I didn't want to do that. First, let me talk about irreducible. It is for irreducible called reducible. If I can write it as a union of two proper closed subsets, so if x is equal to x one two two with x1, x x2 closed subsets of x and they are proper closed subsets. Okay? So, in other words, so if I can write it as a union of two closed subsets, none of which is equal to the whole thing, then I call it reducible. And otherwise, it's called irreducible.
x is equal to x1 into x2, which has xi into x close. Again, it follows x1 is equal to x or x2 is equal to x. So let's make a few remarks about this. So first, you know, it has some kind of strange consequences. For instance, if you have an irreducible uh, topological space, then every non-open sub, no, non-empty open subset is dead. Okay. Let x be an irreducible topological space. Um, and u in x not empty and open then uh, u is dense in x so its closure is the whole of x and this is follows directly from the definition we can write x equal as x minus u union is the closure of u. These are two closed subsets whose union is x. And uh, x minus u is not equal to x because we have assumed that u is non empty. And both are closed. So you use that. So it's just a logical exercise. And one can also check, maybe not so important, that under these conditions, uh, if I have u and x, we also have that u is irreducible. If I have any non-empty closed, non-empty open subset of an irreducible topological space, it would also be irreducible. Okay, so these are some simple facts. Um, and so to get some examples in our algebra geometry, by definition, so the point P in AN is irreducible. Okay, that's kind of clear. Um, and that follows direct from the definition. And uh, by what I told you, if I take the z x y, x times y in uh, e 2 which is equal to the x union z y, so I can write this zero set as the union of two other affine algebraic sets. <coughs> and you can easily see that obviously none of them is equal to this because these are the points where either, either x is 0 or y is 0 and here. So, so this shows that uh, zxy is reducible <coughs> what is also true but which we, what we will not see now is that zx and zy so these coordinate x's are actually irreducible <coughs> That I don't see anymore. And now I wanted to come about. So, as I said, you want to uh, use a topological language to prove this statement that the affine algebraic sets are the union of irreducible components. And so, this we do by talking about Unitarian topological spaces. So, a topological space. X is called Unitarian if uh, every what is it if every descending chain of closed subsets becomes stationary. So if every descending chain 
x, x contains x1, contains x2, of those subsets becomes stationary. So that means we have infinitely many closed subsets, one contained in the other, and become stationary means that after a certain point, they have to be all equal. Okay. Okay, and you, you can see this is very analogous to the similar statement of Notarian for a ring, where instead you have every ascending chain of ideals becomes stationary. So when here the sets become smaller, then the ideal becomes bigger, bigger. But that's kind of obvious that this should be the relation because we were thinking of the ideals of, uh, of an defined algebraic set. The bigger the ideal, the smaller the set. Okay, so now let's see. <coughs> So let's look at some, um, make a first remark and connect it to our algebraic geometry situation. So we first have the remark. So first, any subspace. of a Unitarian topological space is Unitarian. Okay, that means if I take a subset of a Unitarian topological space with the induced topology, it will also be Unitarian. And so, how does it work? So maybe the subspace is called Y, Neural topological space is called X. So if I have a descending chain, one of, uh, of subsets of Y, so assume we have such a descending chain, this will be of the form. Uh, yi is equal to y intersected with xi with the uh, xi in x closed. No, that's, the different, that's because we have a subspace to follow. The closed subsets of y are the intersections of y with the closed subsets of x. Now, in Baroda, we cannot assume that these xi form a chain by, by themselves, because it's just an intersection, but we can force them to form a chain by taking the intersections. So replacing xi by uh, intersection from j from 1 to i, xj, and notice, so if we take this thing, xi has the same intersection with y as this, because the intersections of the xj are contained in each other. No? We know that yi is y intersected xi, and we know that it's descending. So if I do this, uh, so notice uh, which have the same intersection <coughs> y. So the intersection with y of this thing is yi, and the same with intersection of y with this is yi. 
uh, we can assume that this xi form a chain. It means that x contains x1 in a chain of closed subsets in x. So as x is Unitarian, this chain becomes stationary. And as the yi are just intersections of y with the xi, also the chain of the yi becomes stationary. subspace of it is also unitarian. And now I want to see that An is unitarian. So therefore any subspace of An is unitarian and thus in particular every affine algebraic set is unitarian. And this uses obviously that Kx1 to Xn is unitarian as a ring. subspace of An, but in particular any finite algebra set. Is mutated. Okay. So if we prove anything for an eternal topological space, we have proved it for any finite algebra set. And this is quite clear. We just have to translate from the fine algebraic sets, we take their ideas. Yes? What? Yeah? Okay. So let x1 to be chain. So the chain of closed subsets. An. Obviously, it is a risky fault, so a chain of high sets. So then we can look at the ideas. Then, so it's a descending chain. Then, if I take the idea of x1, so this will be contained in the idea of x2, because to, be, to vanishing on a smaller set is less conditions, contained in the idea of x2. That one is a chain of ideas in K, x1 to xn. And because Kx1 to xn is Neutarian, this chain becomes stationary. So we get the Neutarianity 
condition that is in nature in topological space. Now, obviously, one could wonder why we care about such an hypnotic uh, chain condition for closed subsets, but this is sometimes useful in proofs that you make some kind of unitary induction over something. And now, and for instance, it will be used to prove the story about the irreducible uh, components. And we now want to show that every Unitarian topological space is the union of finitely many irreducible topological spaces. And thus, in particular, uh, every finite algebraic set is a, uh, is a finite union of irreducible to finite algebraic sets. And so this is the following statement. So every unitary space is up to the ordering in a unique way. The finite union x of x equals x one union union x r of irreducible closed subsets. This is not quite statement yet. So first one, if I, if I forget about this unique way and the ordering, the first statement is, it is a finite union of irreducible closed subsets. Now, if we, I put an additional condition, uh, this decomposition becomes unique up to how I number them. Namely, uh, such that, uh, so with None contained in the other. Xi is not contained in Xj for i <coughs> different from the. So, so this is kind of an additional condition, and this now makes it unique because obviously, if you you can write even if x is irreducible, you can write x is equal to x union a point, where the point is a point in x. It's kind of stupid. And so we want to exclude uh, this stupidity that we take un unnecessary extra conditions, uh, extra components which already lie in another one. And if we don't take such, this is unique. Okay, um, okay. so let's... Uh, and so, I mean, uh, there's also a definition part. So these are called the irreducible components. The xi are called the irreducible components. Okay. So now we want to prove this. The important part is this existence, namely, basically, we just need to show that we can write x as a finite union of irreducible closed subsets. This condition is then easily fulfilled by just throwing away those, com those parts which are contained in another one. Okay? That doesn't change anything. So, enough. So, I mean, at first, so this is existence. And it's enough to prove uh, the composition that x can be written as x1 union. So R 
with the xi in x closed with the reducible. The condition that no xi is contained in another xj is just, is just fulfilled by saying if an xi is contained in another xj, I remove it from the decomposition because the union of the other ones will still be x because this already was contained in one of them. So, So now the proof is uh, quite indirect. It uses this neutrality property. It's not very constructive. We just assume we can't do this. I mean, there is no such decomposition, and then we arrive at the contradiction. We find that uh, our topological space was not neutral. So it's not very constructive. So let's see. So assume. X does not have such a decomposition. The finite decomposition. So then, in particular, we know that X must be reducible. It cannot be irreducible. Because if it was irreducible, we could just say x equal to x is my decomposition. Okay. So then, in particular, x is reducible. Okay. So we can write. x is equal to x1 union y1, where x1 and y1 are closed. Closed subsets, and none of them is equal to x. And in addition, we wanted that, I mean, this should not have a finite decomposition, so if any of if both of these would have a finite decomposition into irreducible closed subsets, then x would have one, namely by just taking the union of these decompositions. So in addition, one of them, and you know, I choose that the one of them for which is true is x1, uh, say, X1 has, does not have decomposition. Decomposition. Change to finite dimension. Here we split those subsets. But notice this was precisely the condition that we had to be given with on x. So we can do the same thing with x1 that we could do with x. So that means we can write x1 is equal to, uh, say, x2 union y2, where x2 does not have a decomposition in defined many closed subset. Thank you. 
those substances. And so we can make induction. So we have x1, and we do so we do it with x, we get x1, which doesn't have a finite decomposition, we get x2, which doesn't have a finite decomposition to close in the reusable closed subset. So we get a chain of closed subsets which do not have such a finite, so thus get a chain. Subsets. And I mean, one should think also, we have to remember that x1 and y1 are both different from x, so x1 is not equal to x. The same way, x2 and y2 are both different from x1, you know, because of uh, it's supposed to violate irreducibility. So, um, so, so we get, um, get a chain of irreducible closed subsets. So x strictly contains x1, which strictly contains x2. Not, not of close subsets, they are not of close subsets. An infinite chain, I think. And so we have an infinite descending chain where by construction each, in, in, uh, each inclusion is straight. So this violates to make your end. So it's a contradiction. So x nature. Okay. So you can see we haven't it's not really very constructive, we just know if we kind of keep going, it cannot be in, in, in many steps because then the thing would not be unitarian, because you could keep on doing these steps infinitely often and each time it gets more. So in some sense yeah. Okay. Anyway, if you want to say it constructively, it would mean if you just start, take one irreducible piece and split it off, and you keep going, eventually it will have this decomposition. At some point it will stop, because it cannot go on infinity. So in that sense, it's not so indirect to think of it that way. Okay, so this proves the existence. And now the uniqueness is kind of is much simpler. So if we make this assumption that none is contained in the other, then this decomposition is unique up to renumbering them. So uniqueness is also not so important. So assume that x1, so x can be written as x1 union xr and also as y1 union union ys don't, don't have to be the same number x or y uh, so let these be two such decompositions two decompositions into irreducible those subsets which also satisfy this condition so xi is not contained in xj, or i different from j, and yk is not contained in yr, or k different from f. Okay, and then I have to show that these things are just the reordering of these. So I have to show that r is equal to s, and, you know, and as I said, these are the same. Mm -hmm. Each xi is equal to one of the yj's and vice versa. So I can look, I take any of the i's. So xi, uh, I know that x is a union from y1 to ys. So if I intersect, so therefore xi is the same as union i equals 1 to s xi intersected I don't mean it shouldn't be i xi intersected yj and these are closed subsets of x so we have now we have an irreducible closed subset written 
as a union of closed subsets of itself. According to the fact that this is irreducible, one of them must be equal to, uh, to, to xi. So we have that xi is equal to xi intersected yj to some j. And notice that it's equivalent to saying that xi is contained in, in yj for this j. So I know that every xi is contained in one of the yj's. Obviously, I can also in the same way, I could also exchange the role of x and y here in the same way. Each yj is contained in some x, something, so maybe some xk, in some xk. And now we are basically done. So I take my xi, so if xi is contained in yj, and this is contained in xk. So, but we know that this cannot happen. xi cannot be con contained in xk unless i is equal to k. As it follows, i is equal to k. And so these two outside are equal, so the one in the middle is squeezed between them, it has to be equal to both of them. So thus, xi is equal to yj. And so each xi is equal to one of the yj's. The i is equal to k. What? Yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, yeah, obviously equal, I meant equal. Uh, I wrote the opposite. Mm. So, so each x okay. So each x i is equal to one of the y base. Over each x i is equal to one of the y j. And obviously, in the same way, I can exchange the rule uh, of. Uh, the x and the y, we get that each and each yj is equal to 1 of the xi. So they are just reordering of each other. They are the same. Up to reorder. In particular, uh, so this applies to uh, affine to this proof. In particular, this applies to affine algebraic sets. So we get that every affine algebraic set is a union of finite many irreducible components. So. Every fine algebraic set. So, in some sense, therefore, if you know the irreducible defined algebraic sets, you know all algebraic sets because they are just unions of the others. So, we will a lot of the time. Uh, just restrict our attention to the reducible ones, which have some, in some ways, are easier to deal with. And uh, we give them a special name, we call them fine varieties. Mm. 
and irreducible define a pipe set is called in the fine right. Um, I mean, we will later maybe slightly general, slightly change this definition uh, and we know what needs to be isomorphic, but for now, this is the definition. Um, what? Is that classification in R2? Uh, to, well, in any way, we work over the complex numbers, maybe, but then, so I, I don't know what you mean by classification. I mean, you can say circles and lines. Ah, uh, in R2 now, you want to say. Okay. Uh, yeah, it could, there's some, there's some, uh, I mean, if you have, a, so you have either R2 or you have some, could I mention one thing, which would be some kind of union of ovals or something like that. Um, but I don't know precisely what the, I don't know what precisely the statement is. I mean, I don't do real algebraic geometry. I mean, it might, I don't think it's so easy to classify them. I mean, it's not, a, I mean, in principle, you know, there's many kinds of, um, so if you are in, in C2, you can, you know, obviously, there are kind of different issues. So the curves, so if you have just one equation, you get uh, something we want to call an algebraic right curve. So with the complex numbers, this would be a Riemann surface if it's non singular, but it can also have singular points. And singularities can be arbitrarily complicated, contain essentially infinite amount of information. And otherwise, you have the complete classification of Riemann surfaces up to complex. Uh, I mean, I mean, holomorphic isomorphism. So it's not, I mean, there is some kind of classification. Yes. Obviously, if you do it in an arbitrary dimension, things can be arbitrarily complicated, and there's no hope for any kind of classification. Yes. And uh, there is some maps that preserve the structure, like the topology of neomorphism. Yeah, yeah, but that we will have later. But I mean, you can imagine, at least for these affine varieties, uh, the most natural thing for such maps is uh, that the maps coordinate wise are given by polynomials. So that at least as first approximation is a nice definition for the maps one wants to look at. You, if you can such a thing you call a morphism, and if you have an inverse morphism such as with the identity, you call them isomorphic and such things. But if one wants to do it in bigger generality, these morphisms are a little bit more difficult to handle and then need some preparation. So we cannot yes. just say that, that they are a continuous map between AN and AN for the respect to the ISK topology? <coughs> and homeomorphisms for this topology? I don't think that's enough. I mean, um, somehow. I mean, I can't now give a counter example, but it, it, it will not be enough. You have an additional assumption. You need at least that what is called regular functions. So functions which are given by polynomials should somehow be preserved by this, by if you pull them back. Otherwise, it will not work. Uh, and so it's not, it's a bit more, I mean, obviously that it follows, whatever definition you do, they will certainly be continuous in the heuristic quality, but it's not quite enough. I understand everything we did so far, both for infinite, but it doesn't require. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I don't require any. Uh, no, in the moment I make no assumptions uh, about the field. It doesn't have to be algebraically closed, it doesn't have to be perfectly zero, and it doesn't have to be anything. So it's true. Yeah, yeah, it's only occasionally that one needs. Uh, if one wants to make really geometric statements on something that is algebraically closed, in particular when we come to this. Nullstellensatz, we do need some version of algebra close. <laughs> so, so the nice, this is very simple German name. Very easy to pronounce for a German. <laughs> uh, okay, let me now see where I was. Um, 
Okay, and so, uh, yeah, and I want to see <coughs> that uh, we have, uh, so this now is a bit abstract and we don't also see how we can check that a uh, finite algebraic set is irreducible. Okay, I, I draw some pictures, but that doesn't, so how do you, it's somehow in algebraic geometry you want to use algebra to understand the geometry, so can we, for instance, read up from the algebra whether uh, and find algebra set is And in fact, we can, namely, we can see it from the idea. So, uh, the following statement. So, proposition. So I really should remind you the idea of an affine algebraic set is a set of all polynomials. So if the root x is in the end, the fine algebraic set is a set of all polynomials uh, such that f uh, of p is equal to 0 for all p in x. Or if you want if f restricted to x is zero. Okay, now, so this is somehow the an ideal which is naturally associated to my fine alpha x at x, and I want to see property from it. So, so x in the end is my fine algebraic right set. And then x is irreducible. If and only if ix is a primary. Okay? So we have an algebraic statement which is equivalent to irreducibility. <coughs> That's quite so in particular, for instance, we see, which would not be if our obvious that uh, if I take AM, this is irreducible. Because the only polynomial which vanishes on the whole of the N is zero. And so the ideal zero, because the ideal zero is certainly a prime ideal in K. No, because we are uh, over a field. So polynomials with coefficients in a field certainly has no zero divisors and uh, you know, we have that. So just as an example, so we for instance see it follows from that if we just take the complex line like this or the real line, uh, we cannot write it as a union of two closed subsets unless one of them is equal to the whole thing. That's one of the properties of the realistic form. Okay. okay, so now let's prove it. Ah. So what am I thought? So we have two directions, obviously. We assume that x is reducible. Reducible. And we take two elements in I of x. <coughs> Not in I of x. Uh, so just f and g are two polynomials. And we take uh, this product. Contained in the zero set f times g. 
which is the same as the zero set of f union zero set of g. So that means I can write x equal to x intersected the zero set of f union x intersected the zero set of g. And these are two closed subsets. So it follows, so we have written x as union of two closed subsets, so one of them must be equal to x. So it follows that x is equal to x intersected 0 set of f, which means that f vanishes on the whole of x, in other words, that f is in the idea of x, or x is equal so x intersected the zero set of g, which means that g is in the zero. In any case, this shows if f times g is in the idea of x, then one of them applies. So for uh, x is a prime. The other direction is not much more difficult. <coughs> Basically, again, we kind of just work out the definitions. So we make an indirect proof, so we make the contraposition. So we assume that uh, x can be written as x1 union x2 uh, for some closed subsets uh, xe, which are strictly contained in x. So in other words, we assume that x is reducible, and we have to show that uh, its ideal is not a primary. So we know that the zero set of the ideal of x1, no, this is a, a fine algebraic set, the zero set of its idea is x1. And this is strictly contained in x, which is the zero set of x. So, in particular, well, anyway, this I don't need, but that means that there is an element in the ideal of x1 which does not vanish on x, okay. on the whole of x. Plus, uh, there exists in f1 in the ideal of x1 without the ideal of x. No, because uh, if uh, you know, we see that uh, the zero set of this is actually smaller, so there must be one element whose zero set does not contain the full effect. And so in the same way, there exists an element F2 in the idea of X2 minus the of X. But then, um, what happens to, so if I take f1 times f2, so f1 vanishes on x1, f2 vanishes on x2, so it follows that f1 times f2 vanishes on x1 union of x2. So thus, one times f two is an element in I x. So here we have found two elements which do not lie in the ideal of x whose product does. Okay, so we just have carefully used the definitions, and so then I x is not defined. Okay. 
D. This was this. And now we will start with the wonderful river Wulstellensatz. So um, I will also write them. <coughs> I will also write it not in uh, German. But, uh, so this section is now called the Hilbert Wulstellensatz. So that means the translation would be Hilbert Hilbert of zero. So that means theorem. Nullstelle means the place where something is zero. Okay. And Hilbert is Hilbert. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so we have that. So we can we have this correspondence. We have we have looked at the fine algebraic set in the end, and we have looked at ideas in K x1 to xn, and uh, they are somehow related. We can if we have an affine algebraic set, we can look at this idea. So x is sent to the ideal of x. If we have an idea in Kx1 towards n, we can look at its zero set. So say j is left to the zero set of j. Now you could ask yourself, does this mean that the fine algebraic sets are in some sense the same as ideals in Kx1 to Xn, that this is a bijection. No? Or if it's not a bijection, you know, where does it fail and in what sense might it be almost a bijection? So, um, and you are the inverse to each other. So we have the following remark. First, uh, we have already seen this, but I just repeat it for uh, So if we have an idea, so for an idea, J in Kx1 for Xn, it is clear that if I take the idea of the zero set of J, this will contain J. Because the zero set of J is the set of all points in AN where all elements of J are zero. The ideal of the zero set is all functions which vanish on this set. Now, as the elements of J, by definition, no, the Z of J was defined as the set where the elements of J vanish, so certainly it's contained in I of Z of J by definition. Okay, so this is by definition. But uh, on the other hand, I've already told you a few times, and it, I call it exercise, we know also that. And um, if we do it the other round, so if x in the n is in the fine algebraic set, then if I take the zero set of the idea of x, this will be equal to x. And maybe, you know, I, before I made an exercise, but now I will maybe also prove it. So by definition, Uh, if I take the zero set 
of the idea of X. This will certainly contain X because the elements of I of X are all the fun all the polynomials which vanish on X. Certainly the locus where all of them vanish contains X. Okay, that's the definition. But I want to claim it's equal. So for this I have to use that X is in a fine algebra X set. Because otherwise it will not be true. So we know that X is in a fine algebra X set. That means we can write x equal to z of j for some idea. Now we know that every fine algebra set is a zero set of an idea. Okay. So by part one. We have so by one, so what was there, we have J is contained in I of Z of J. Which is I of X. But we know if the ideal becomes larger, the zero set becomes smaller. So thus, x, which is the zero set of j, uh, contains, is correct? Yeah. So j is contained, so this contains um, the uh, zero set of the idea of x. So thus we have both inclusions. x is contained in the zero set of the idea of x and it contains the idea of the zero set of x. So, and so we see therefore if we look at these two maps, if we make this, comp this composition that we, uh, that we start within a fine algebra x set, then take its idea and then its zero set, we get to where we started. If we do it the other way around, if we start with an idea, we take its zero set, and then take the idea of that, then maybe we get to where we started, or maybe we don't, we haven't decided yet. But we have this inclusion at least. So, uh, So the question, so the question that remains is uh, is for, for for an ideal J is the ideal of the zero set of J equal to J or if not. What is the relation? So we start with a simpler version of this question. special case where the zero set, you know, say is the empty set. So what are the ideals whose zero set is the empty set? So um, you know, we know that the zero set of the whole polynomial ring is the empty set. Now the question is, is this the only ideal in the polynomial ring for which this is the case? So what are the ideals? So we know uh, 
um, z of k x1 x n is the empty set. So is this the only idea? And that is the weak version of the null standard. So, uh, so weak null standard. Which you could also say, which is the statement that uh, the only idea whose zero set is the empty set is kx1 to xn. So the only idea which has no zeros is kx1 to xn. Or if you want to say it more positively, if you have any idea which is not the whole polynomial ring, it has zeros. So in German, it has no stand. <laughs> no? So that's the no stand. So, so now let i in kf1 is then the proper idea. So strictly proved it. Let uh, so then the zero set of i is not empty. Every proper idea is zero. Let me just see what is a good moment. Um, so I should say, after this big announcement, I'm not actually, at least for now, going to prove this. So I will. We will. Lay, so it needs uh, quite some preparation to prove this. Is a statement of algebra. Uh, if uh, we feel like it, we could prove it much later in the course when all the preparations have been done for because we need them for something else. Um, so when we talk about dimension, but otherwise I just leave it as a statement. So it's an algebraic statement. It requires a couple of lectures to prove, and I don't want to do it at least now. Uh, I just want to state finally as ah, and I should say there's one assumption that I'm missing here, which is related to these questions, namely this is we assume here, uh, so we have here to assume uh, I'm not in enough room, but anyway, we have to assume so that k be algebraically closed. If k is not algebraically closed, the statement is false. There are plenty of ideas whose uh, zero set is empty. For instance, you can see uh, in, uh, for instance, you know, just as an example, <coughs> I don't have it yet. Uh, if you take a uh, the idea generated by, say, x squared plus 1 in Rx are severe numbers, then, so this obviously, uh, you know, this, the zero set of that is m. Uh, so if I take not the, idea, the zero set of this polynomial, is m. So this is the same as the zero set. The real generator is n. Because obviously there is no real number whose square is minus 1. Okay. But uh, over n. Okay, and then maybe as a last statement, uh, the way we usually use this result. We don't use it so often two or three times in this course in the following form. Namely, um, this is the following statement. It's just reformulation. Uh, if, if I take an idea in Kx1 to Xn, in idea whose zero set is empty, Then it follows that 1 lies in the 
obviously we know if the zero set is empty, then uh, the idea must be the whole of k is one plus n, therefore it contains one. And obviously, if an idea contains one, that's the whole thing. But the thing is that it's actually useful to have explicitly one. It somehow means then that you can somehow write one as a linear combination of something that has useful in the proof of many things. Okay, you will see this. So next time we will formulate the strong version of the null standards, which gives a precise relation between the ideas and the zero sets, that it will be proven you know, using the weak form. But uh, now I've talk, uh, you know, I promised I would uh, go over time this time, and I kept my promise. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, thank you. Uh,